Today, we have two presenters who will be taking us through their different papers. They are both working on uh, Otaj tangentially and one directly on Ubuntu. One paper is by Dr. Efwa Pra, and Efwa Pra is working on young mothers in Cape Town, looking at notions of freedom for young moms when there are structural constraints around mental, maternal health looking at the ways in which being a mom is reaffirmed in the everyday lives of moms. Another paper is by Dr. Emile Dioff. Uh, the paper is another, it's, a, it's, a, it's looking at figurations of gender-based violence, uh, not looking directly at Ubuntu, but Emily considers, but rather looking at what Emily considers cultural specific approaches to engaging the trauma of gender-based violence in public memory. She looks at rituals and survivor-led initiatives that seek to ensure equal and equitable access to justice for disadvantaged and marginalized groups. Emily's work draws from what she's been doing in the Gambia with associations of childless women, or what she calls Kaneleng Kafu. For both of our speakers, this is very preliminary work, so something to consider as meditations. And we look forward to hearing your comments and getting your questions as a way of enriching uh, the different projects that they're involved in. I'll quickly introduce the speakers, starting with Dr. Efwa Pra, who's joining us from Cape Town. Both our speakers will have about 20 minutes each. Uh, and I will introduce first Dr. Efwa Pra. Dr. Efwa Pra works at Stellenbosch University in the Department of Sociology and Anthropology. She has previously worked as a health systems consultant and health policy advisor to government institutions. She's also taught leadership studies at Ashesi Liberal Arts College in Accra, Ghana, and has lectured in the Department of Anthropology and Sociology at the University of the Western Cape. Dr. Pra's work, uh, or interests rather, they range widely from critical methodological practices in the social sciences to assessing and accounting for the impact of violence that it has on young people's health and well being. Some of her interests also include critical race theory, anthropological theorizations in intercontinental African migration politics, refugee studies, adolescent and childhood studies, and studies of the embodiment of sexuality, pregnancy, and birthing. Dr. Pra's title for today's presentation is, how is Ubuntu articulated as a freedom in the current era for young mothers in Cape Town, South Africa? I'll hand over to you, Dr. Pra. You have about 20 minutes. After that, I will introduce Dr. Emily Dioff, and also she'll have about 20 minutes and we will open it up for a conversation with our guests and I want to invite people before you start, if they can just drop their questions and comments in the chat box at the bottom. Uh, then we'll go over those when both the speakers have finished presenting. Over to you, Efwa. Uh, thanks very much, Asanda, and thank you for the opportunity to be part of the Ubuntu Dialogues. Um, <clears throat> so I'll just jump straight into it. Um, talking uh, essentially about how I'm seeing the, the nexus between Ubuntu, freedom, um, motherhood, um, and affect theory. Um, <clears throat> so what this contribution of, of, what the contribution I want to make um, is uh, an exploration into notions of freedom um, in the context of structural constraints around maternal health and well-being for young people in Cape Town. Um, the theoretical framework that I'm working with uh, draws on Thomas Chordas's work and his ideas around embodiment, which were influenced by um, Merlo, Maurice Merleau-Ponty and Pierre Bourdieu, um, which signaled a move away from looking at the body as uh, a subject on which things happen, um, to more of a, a focus of the, the, the beingness of performativity. So how we are, how we enact our private and public um, performances. Um, and this is what um, I like to phrase or has been phrased as the art of sensibility. And this sensibility, as I understand it, is the launch point of 
and affective theory, which finds resonance in the primary concepts of Ubuntu. So I'm interested in looking into the possible intersect between Ubuntu and embodiment. Um, and embodiment is encapsulated in concepts like personhood, identity, belonging. Um, and I'm very cautious here because um, I'm trying to figure through what I'm hoping to term as a subjective freedom, um, which I'm going to circle back to um, right at the end of this presentation. Um, and what also needs to be flagged here is that I'm very careful not to um, try and unpick psychoanalytical framings of free will and freedom, but rather I'm more interested in exploring um, concepts of development and freedom that have sprung from Amatya Sen's um, 1999 uh, work um, that is centered around um, uh, freedom as a development and development as a freedom. Um, and what Sen, what, what Sen produces in, in the seminal piece of work is that, um, well, essentially it was a critique um, against a sort of myopic and very narrow-minded reading of um, development practice, um, particularly from the IMF and the World Bank, that measured success and development in the country's um, sort of developmental prowess through, through the economic lens alone. Um, and so the growth or the GNP um, does not equate to an expansion of freedoms enjoyed by peoples within a society. Um, and so what is important to remember um, here is that for Sen, freedoms are dependent on other societal determinants like social and economic structures. Um, for example, um, facilities of education and healthcare situations, which are central to um, the work that I'm doing around motherhood um, in a very sort of a, a kind of a, a space that is it's newly formed and it's caught uh, between and between his well between eras so a lot of the people um, who are living in Delft are uh, were, were um, previously previously displaced um, during apartheid years and then that initial displacement during apartheid has set in motion um, a very cyclical pattern of generations that have to keep moving in fact generations that are caught in forced removals um, constantly so um, they are definitely not living in in a sense of freedom but yet there are ways in which small freedoms are etched out um, and so what Sen says here is that um, the exercise of freedom freedom is mediated by values um, but that those values in turn are influenced by public discussions and social interactions which are themselves influenced by participatory freedoms. Freedoms are not the only primary ends of development. They also are among its principal means. So for, for, for my work, a thriving civil, a civic life is thus based on the maneuverability of what Ubuntu offers. Um, for the young woman living in Delft, the practice to share in motherhood has opened up space for the young woman to act out these freedoms, albeit limited um, in their formation. Um, these freedoms um, are what Ubuntu advances, and the free agency is seen as a constitutive part of development. Um, so, of course, over the decades, there have been a number of assessments of, of Sen's work, um, and uh, one of the critiques uh, that is presented, which I, um, which I, I think are very important to consider, um, is that it, that his work lacks the an elaboration um, of how, because um, he he elucid, he he explains four different kinds of of freedoms, but doesn't actually show the inter interconnectedness of those endings that establish and maintain development as a freedom. Um, but another thing that he also misses out on is um, he doesn't he 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 doesn't actually have a, a, a strong focus on the power. The power, ooh, goodness, the power structures that shape um, unequal development paradigms. Um, so, what I what I, I do want to celebrate about Sen's work um, is that it um, it further elucidated uh, much of the post-colonial discourse, particularly Arturo Escobar's examination of the proliferation of development policies 
and how this sets the stage of a continued colonization of ideas and resources. Um, so in this sense, I'm very mindful to avoid a simple varnishing over of ideas that freedom is a phenomenon that can somehow be forged through the implementation of productive development structures because um, South Africa does have, I mean, there's a lot of shortcomings that um, South Africa struggles with, but in terms of infrastructure um, and policies, um, really the citizens of South Africa um, in just examining examining the policies and the, the infrastructures that we have, we should be doing a lot better than we are doing. And we should be enjoying a lot more of the freedoms, at least outlined by um, Sen's work. Um, <clears throat> so in saying that, the, the course that I'm interested in completing is the exploration of the multiple ways in which young mothers um, emerge with a particular kind of freedom to reinvent positivist ideas of who and what counts as a mother. Um, and this is directly born from a shared experience of motherhood. Um, and it is this shared experience that I'm labeling as a practice of Ubuntu. Um, and the attainment of these freedoms acts as a simulacrum of the Ubuntu maxim, I am because we are where the individual I is not an island, but rather is part of an archipelago of eyes um, within a society. So just to give you a little bit of a context of what I'm talking about, I keep talking about um, these motherhoods that are shared in, in, <laughs> in Delft. Um, and it might do me well to possibly share the link, um, share the link to a, docu a short documentary film that I made um, around uh, particularly the two mothers um, that are reinventing who counts as a mother and what counts as a mother. So they're collapsing, they're collapsing consagonal um, bonds and also um, uh, sort of like reinventing a kin network that's not based on 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 biology um, and and more resting on a shared experience of of I guess survival in some way, in some ways. Um, and, and, and they, they're, they're very young. Um, I don't want, I mean, I think that the documentary speaks for itself, but just a, a, a brief synopsis of the documentary, um, film is that, um, it, it focuses on one particular young woman, um, who's had a, who's had a, a rather traumatic journey into, into motherhood, but yet, um, and has experienced a lot of loss in terms of, of motherhood, but um, her neighbor, who is, happens to be her best friend, and they've grown up with each other since they were seven, and both of them have been involved in multiple cycles of displacement, um, and yet they've always managed to stay together. Um, and so they, they the, the, one, the one woman, a young woman, um, has birthed and, and essentially they share in, in the responsibility of looking after the little one. Um, so <clears throat> that's just a rough uh, context of, of who these mothers I'm talking about are. Um, and so the preliminary research that I conducted um, was situated in The Hague um, in Delft. Uh, which is a which is a suburb about 35 kilometers, 35 to 40 kilometers um, out of the city center, um, and that research supports the notion that practices of Ubuntu are forged daily as these young women navigate their recourse to health and well-being. Um, and what is evident is that these experiences are both varied and primarily contingent on the shared experience of birthing and motherhood. Um, I'm also, of course, as an uh, anthropologist, it's not a sociological um, argument that I'm making. I'm not trying to make a generalization of an entire population, um, but yet I'm more interested in sort of micro history and that and that ethnographic experience of, of how Ubuntu itself can be can afford a reimagining of of placement, belonging, um, and selfhood. Um, so just to also now give a, a, a short context of, of why I think Ubuntu, the, you know, the emergence of Ubuntu has for me as an important um, discourse to work with is that 
the so the emergence of the popular notions of Ubuntu uh, can be loosely traced back to Thabo Mbeki's call, um, at least certainly here in South Africa, um, for an African Renaissance um, in his famous I Am an African speech in 1996. Um, and then also the deliberations that had, were, were, that had sprung from the truth telling of the Truth and Reconciliation Commission, um, where Desmond Tutu was really leading with this idea of, of Ubuntu. So the emergence onto a publicly debated space launched a series of reflections on exactly what Ubuntu was. And at best, Ubuntu could more accurately be described as an operational meditation on acts of humane communication and collectivization. So this aspect of human collectivism and communication um, is, is at the base of multiple African lauric systems that premise collective consciousness as paramount to individual existence. And so the maxim, I am because we are, um, is heralded as the foundation of an, ex of an understanding of Ubuntu. And in the words of John Mbiti, um, uh, he says, I am because we are, and since we are, therefore I am. So Mbisi was, you know, pushing for an ontological framing and a theorization around um, um, Ubuntu. Um, and this maxim, I am because we are, is ubiquitous in its presence in daily interactions. Um, and it is evinced in, in many African laurel, mo local moral economies of exchange. So living in Ubuntu means living in consciousness, where Ubu, the collective, is yoked with Ndu, the person, um, and the combined meaning is, is something that can at best be described as the essence of oneness, where Umtu Ngumtu Ngabanti, which literally means um, a person is a person through other persons. So this is a Zulu proverb that effectively translates what Ubuntu is. We see here that Ubuntu um, is, is a very lively essence of being, um, where its definition unfolds in the creation of a, of a present interaction and its strength is generated in reconciliatory, reciprocal and convivial relating. And so at the center of Ubuntu is an implicit understanding of humility and interactions, which is exactly what um, um, manifests itself amongst uh, the young women in Delft. Um, who share their daily experiences, share their traumas, share their reflections about motherhood. And that, that, that essence of trust um, and that essence that um, they are both mothers to this little one, it, it feels almost like as if it goes beyond what I've read about, how, about who, we, who, we, who we describe as kin. It's so much more than um, the affinal and consagonal bonds. It's, something that I think I want to try and express as this act of Ubuntu that surpasses how anthropology has theorized around um, kin networks um, because, it's, because their bond is not, it cannot be described in, in those ways. I feel like it's so much more than that. And, um, you know, what makes sense to me is that it is an expression of Ubuntu where um, she, both, both of them are given life through the, their service to each other. Um, so <clears throat> Ubuntu in practice then becomes the work of fostering the art of sensibility um, in that Heideggerian sense of being in the world. Um, and central to this idea is that making ourselves human is an ongoing process that begins in various ways across several layers of socialization um, and indeed incorporates this affective presentation of the senses. Um, and central to my thinking through this idea of, of affect theory, because that's also something that I want to work with, um, is George asks this question, so how do we make ourselves human? Um, and it's this humanizing aspect which, is, which, which seems to find resonance in a lot of expressions of what Ubuntu is, is that I am, I become human through my interaction with other humans. So how do we make ourselves human? Um, for me, I think the young, the young women express that beautifully every day in their shared motherhood is that they, are, they afford themselves the freedom to, um, to, to, to reimagine who a mother is and to reimagine what a human um, becomes. Um, and um, 
just tangentially, this is where my research is. I'm, I'm very interested in looking at pregnancy, birthing and motherhood. Um, and what usually is, is happens in, in looking at pregnancy, birthing and motherhood is that it, it takes a feminist theoretical lens and analysis. Um, and there's many works that have, have focused on the marginalization and oppression of women and from their own bodies. Um, and there's a lot of stuff that, that is written about um, uh, the, the undermining of epistemic validity of what women know about their bodies during pregnancy, birthing and motherhood. Um, and so I want to retain some of those um, very important work, feminist literature around um, the body. Um, and then I want to try and match it with affect theory. And then I want to try and match it with Ubuntu. So perhaps maybe I'm trying to do too much in one. So I would, you know, it'd be great to, to hear some feedback on whether that's just trying to do too much. Um, and and what, what, what led me down this path um, many years ago actually was um, I, I was sitting in, in, in my friend's kitchen and we were talking about her journey into motherhood. Um, and, um, and this is me talking to a friend of mine, um, and she she is a young Rastafarian mother, um, and she she described birthing and motherhood in, in a really beautiful way. She said, "Birthing to me is to bring forth something, to nurture it, to grow it for a lifetime. I wouldn't even see birthing as that one time when you're pushing out. It takes a lot of you to push a whole human out." So yes, you've burst something, but now you have to nurture it. You have to grow it. Um, and this birthing and motherhood in this expression is more like a longitudinal journey and expression of life. And it's a more of a sustained process where life has grown and the body gives service to a life that has grown. Um, and this description echoes um, another really important um, ethnography by Cecilia McCullum, um, uh, based on Kashinahua, um, who live in the Peruvian Amazon. Um, and uh, she, she asked us to reconsider um, how we approach sociality, sexuality, and the body, which is essentially what I'm trying to do is I'm, I'm trying to question, I'm trying to broaden or maybe rather concentrate the discussion, anthropological discussions around kinship. Um, and show that perhaps perhaps we can look at Ubuntu as an anchor anchoring point that it's actually a making of humanness, uh, not necessarily a making of kin. Um, <clears throat> so the importance of uh, McCullum's work is that in my particular context is her reading of Kashinahua ontology. So she says, for the Kashinahua persons are made, they're not born. Um, and so what is an analysis is how we make ourselves human. So back to that question, you know, what is a human? McCallum shows how in Kashinahua cosmological frameworks, real persons are both makers of other bodies and also the accumulated effect of a mirrored consumption. So I'm not gonna get into the mirrored consumptions, but what is important here is that real persons are both um, the makers of their own bodies, but also other people's bodies. Um, and for Kashinahua, um, uh, relationships or kin are made through procreation, through childbirth, and also through childcare. And it's that element that I'm interested in: is that we can we also find ourselves, um, or we, we can we can find that we belong um, to ourselves and indeed to other people through this practice of childcare and sh and shared motherhood. Um, and this shared social tapestry of kin making is exactly the performative reality of the two families I work with in Delft who etch out these freedoms to make and indeed to unmake kin. Um, so part of, um, I think I'm slowly coming up on my 20 minutes. Um, and so um, there's another uh, piece of work that I'm also um, interested in bringing into the fold, um, and that's Meredith Nash's work. And she, and she argues that there are various aspects of the embodied experience of pregnancy, birthing, uh, and motherhood um, as an extension. Um, and, and, it's, and, and it leans back on feminist theory here, um, where 
where we could reconfigure contemporary feminine uh, femininities. Um, and we can do this when we look at shared motherhood um, as expressed through Ubuntu. So this motherhood is un understood as an expression of Ubuntu. And in the case of, of the two young women, um, as a marker of belonging somewhere and a compelling experience of personhood um, that is forged or etched out in very precarious situations. Um, and this articulation of shared motherhood and the freedoms that uh, are born from the shared motherhood um, are, are really where I also want to bring in affect theory or the affective turn suddenly presents itself. Um, and and in, in this way, the performance played by individuals helps us to situate responses and manage interactions. Um, and that's the affective, the, the affective turn that is possible through, um, through a shared mother, um, a shared experience of motherhood. Um, and the, the shared experience of motherhood becomes part of a script where behavior is determined by a set of causes and effects and the constant uh, consequent reenactions and reenactments. So in the everyday, um, the two young women are constantly um, reinforcing. So they're reinforcing the ideas of the, the ideas of placement um, in the world. Um, if you do get a chance to watch the documentary, you'll see that in one of the instances, um, one of the young mothers says, "I don't, I, I, I don't go a day without." Um, waking up and making sure that my little baby, you know, there's, there's not a day, essentially she's saying there's not a day that goes by that um, I don't interact with the other woman or that she's not the port of call. Um, and it's these reenactments of what, or what Goff, Irving Goffman calls sign vehicles that bind behavior um, and that um, allow, uh, allow these uh, freedoms to flourish. Um, and also it's these sign vehicles um, that categorize and produce performances of Ubuntu. So, so essentially the, the, the marriage between looking at shared motherhood as an expression of Ubuntu, especially, especially as, as I've you know, recently become um, a mother, it, it, it's such for me it becomes so much more clearer that um, this continuous making of, of humans is really done in a shared experience and that not sharing in that experience somehow um, denies us the freedom to really be um, almost like a full expression of, of a human um, and so in 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 closing, I think I, I think I'm coming. I think I'm, I'm done with my 20 minutes. Actually, um, it is that Ubuntu. I would like to see Ubuntu um, worked a lot more into um, a discourse of development, a discourse of of embodiment. Um, and and I think a, a useful way is to try and tackle. Um, the affective performance. So the thing that's almost unnameable. Um, so we, we're tackling the affective performances um, and using those as a sign vehicle to try and understand the importance of, of this practice of Ubuntu. Um, and the example that I have is of course the documentary film um, where shared motherhood it's seen, it seems so vividly and so clearly that um, both, both mothers become human, they become people um, in interaction of this, sh this experience of shared motherhood. Um, and because of this interaction, um, there is a sense of, of freedom to, there's a sense of freedom to, to unpack some of the stresses and strains of, um, uh, of their lives. Thank you.
Um, so that's that's what I wanted to present. Um, Asanda, I'm not sure if I have, um, I, I actually didn't start timing it, it just felt like 20 minutes. Um, but I wonder, do I have a bit more time to elaborate or shall we? Um, maybe let's pause for now and uh, you can elaborate when people raise questions during the Q&A session. How's that? That's perfect. That's perfect. Okay, great. Thank you so much for F F for that very interesting reflection uh, on these two mothers. I would have really liked to see the documentary, but I'm in Cape Town with you. I guess I can only see it. But you, you offered us a lot of very interesting concepts around shared motherhood. And uh, I'm hoping that people will ask a lot of questions as you were talking about Ubuntu and about shared motherhood and Tabumbeki making reference to Tabumbeki's speech and Desmond Tutu, a lot of questions were certainly sparked in my head, but I will not go into those now. We'll get into those during the Q&A session. I will quickly run to Senegal where Dr. Emil Diop is joining us. Uh, leave Cape Town for a bit. So I'll introduce Dr. Diof uh, and just to say also that she's got about 20 minutes and, uh, and then we can open it up for a Q&A. And if people have questions for EFUA, they can start populating the Q&A session at the bottom. Uh, Dr. Emily Diof uh, is an assistant professor in English of English at Brandeis University. She specializes in Anglophone and Francophone post-colonial African literatures and film with an emphasis on gender, feminist theory, trauma, and cultural memory. Her publications have focused on the interdisciplinary study of the relationship between narrative, trauma, and human rights. She's currently working on a book manuscript titled Errant Voices, Trauma and the Textual Making of African Women Refugees. The book explores how trauma narratives by African women enable trauma studies to gain a foothold on the often complex sociocultural, political, and economic systems that determine vulnerability across various discursive modes. The paper that Dr. Dioff will be presenting today is her ponderings on a second project, which is a book that explores trauma and ritual performance as basic grounds for survivor-led approaches to gender inclusivity in processes of transitional justice in three West African countries, the Gambia, Sierra Leone, and Liberia. The title of uh, Emile's paper is Figurations of Gender-Based Violence and Trauma in Public Memory. Emile, over to you, about 20 minutes. Yeah, I was up. muted, yes. <laughs> thank you so much, Asanda, and thank you to Efua for a very informative and rich um, paper. And thank you for being you and the African Studies Center, um, the um, Alliance for African Partnership for uh, starting this initiative. And to all my kinfolks at Michigan State, which is also home <laughs> to me, um, I send my greetings and love. Um, so this is um, a very out of early, I would say, the early reflections on what I am conceiving currently as a second book project. Um, and so they are more questions than answers. <laughs> and I hope um, to engage you in those questions. So I am going to, um, first I'll start with a story and the story was a testimony presented to the Gambias through Reconciliation and Reparation Commissions um, on October 14, 2019. And then I'll proceed with reading the silences um, in the story and then raising questions about the issues of inclusivity and uh, representations or perceptions of sexual and gender-based violence in um, transitional justice mechanisms on the continent, but especially in the Gambia. And then I'll proceed to looking at um, parallel forms of and, and practices of dealing with um, sexual and gender-based violence in the quotidian and the ways in which they question violence and, and the structures that normalize it before even we get to talk about authoritarian rule um, 
through Kenya Lang Women Associations. And um, I will briefly talk about some of the performances and um, segue to how I see Ubuntu here through um, the Kenya Lang Women Associations practice, but also approaches and also existence in parallel to the transitional justice mechanism in the Gambia as an ethics and moral and also aesthetics of care. Um, so how do we think of um, Ubuntu as care and he especially a care that is embodied through um, um, issues related to motherhood, childlessness and so on. So fully some intersection with a forward paper, but here um, we'll see. All right, so I'll start with the story on April 2000, Senabu Kamara, known as Seni Kamara, was a student at Bakote High School, also known as Herman High School. And unfortunately, she could not complete her schooling because of her encounter with Gambian security forces during what is referred to throughout the Gambia as a student massacre of 2000. Of 2000 sorry. She, was she was scheduled to have exams on that day, but students were protesting the torture and killing of a fellow student by Gambian firemen in March of that year, as well as the rape of a 13 year old by a soldier in April at a stop sporting event. On her way to school, Saini decided to join the protests with schoolmates and was arrested by security forces. While in detention, she was tortured and likely raped. But she does not use the term rape even when commissioners ask specific question. During her October 14th, um, 2019 testimony at the Truth, Reconciliation and Reparation Commissions, Saini Kamala recalled with anguish how officers had tied her with a rope and stamped on her from her chest down to her legs. The witness did not recall how she got to the hospital, but a female nurse told her she was brought to the morgue and was labeled corpse number three. Saini Kamara was in the hospital for three months and suffered from heavy bleeding and wounds in her private parts. Commenting on the psychological impact of her encounter with the security forces, she stressed out, she stressed out that it is, that that is how the, sorry. She stressed out that the most painful aspect of that encounter was that she had never told anybody. Sorry, I forgot to share my screen. Yes, the PowerPoint presentation. Hopefully I can show it. A minute. I swear I did this before and it worked. And you have witnesses. We saw you doing it. <laughs> yes. So I'll try again. Uh, okay. Here it is. Perfect. Let me see. All right. So I should have shown this beginning. I'll move to this. Um, the only person she had told this to was her late husband. And the reason why she told him was because the doctors had told her that she would not be able to have children. After three years, her late husband came to take her hand in marriage. Saini Kemara said that she took out the document and showed it to him and asked if he would want to marry someone who could not have children. He insisted on marrying her. The witness recalled that in 2003, she got pregnant, but as she was still suffering from her injuries, she gave birth to premature twins. She added that in a subsequent delivery, she experienced complications. Saini points out that being silent 
has been the most painful aspect of a traumatic experience. One of close transitional justice mechanisms such as the Truth Reconciliation and Reparation Commission as they open up possibilities for excavating stories of pain that have been encrypted in the trenches of authoritarian rule. Although the hearings of the Gambian Truth and Reconcil Truth Re Reconciliation Operation Commissions have enabled women like Saini Kamara to add their voices to the recounting of the Gambia's horrific past and the IAMS regime, her resistance to name her abuse challenges us to think about the ordering of various forms of women's human rights abuses in transitional justice processes on the continent. As such, I ask, how does Saini Kamara's traumatic experience figure in the TRC's conceptualization of, the, of political injury, justice, and public memory? As the Gambia's Truth Reconciliation and Reparation Commission has sought to learn from the South African TRC and has devoted extreme care to sexual and gender-based violence, I wonder how Saini Kamara's deliberately unspoken truth might help us understand the challenges of negotiating and organizing public memory, especially in relation to some African social cultural contexts in which revealing one's experience of sexual violence might mark one as impure, tainted, and hence dehumanized survivor. How can the principle of Ubuntu as embraced and practiced by Gambian women and what are also the implication of importing the concept, um, which was kind of a philosophical um, under, um, you know, the philosophy underlying the TRC's process. Um, what are the implications of thinking of Ubuntu in a different context here, although still African? Here, the other the question um, that I interrupted myself reading is how can the principles of Ubuntu embraced and as practiced by Gambian women equip us with the aesthetics, politics, and ethics to rehumanize victims of sexual and gender-based violence in public memory? And, I'm just going to talk about the TRC's mandate here, since I'm thinking of um, what I would later talk um, about, discuss the Kanyalenka fold and how I see the praxis of Ubuntu um, and um, in parallel or in contrast to the mandates of the Truth and Reconciliation Commission. Um, the Truth, Reconciliation and Reparation Commission's mandate in the Gambia. So the goal of the, um, the TRRC is one, to establish, and you can see this also on the website of the TRRC um, online, um, to, to establish an impartial historical record of human rights abuse, and this dating from July 19, 19, 1994 to January 2017. And so the second is to promote healing. And so the promotion of healing, of course, storytelling is at the center, since also um, the mandate and also the processes of the Truth Reconciliation Reparation Commissions have been influenced by other um, Truth and Reconciliation Commission on the continent and South Africa has had a heavy influence as well as Ghana's process. Um, so, but the main focus here for the Gambia is the of prevention and, and avoiding non-recurrence and to really think about what is in the cultural imagery, the political culture of the Gambia that is an enabler of, of authoritarian rule. So, um, aside from hearings and the work of the secretariat, there are also outreach programs and um, including rehabilitation, thinking of memorialization processes and compensation. And so that leads to considering reparations for victim. And here so far as of um, 
October 12, when the hearings resumed and also facing challenges um, brought uh, about by the onslaught of COVID-19, um, medical care to victims, um, and also um, providing food for those who are economically and socially affected by the COVID-19 pandemic. So that is, I think, one of the ways in which reparation has been made in concrete in some way. But in, in say, uh, in Sainabu Kamara's story, I think the reparation there is the, the ability to have a platform to share a story, to tell her story. And yet what is interesting is that she's not telling it in the format that maybe the TRC is pushing her to do, which is to name um, the violence that was done to her. So there were many probing questions. If you look at the testimony online on the website of the TRC, you'll notice that at many times there were questions about, you know, were there um, any evidence of rape or were there any evidence of other um, things being inserted into her and so on. But she does, um, she kind of um, talks about how she passed out and doesn't remember. So memory and also the issue of forgetting, but also the agency in choosing what to narrate is very interesting. And so in light of that, I think there's an interesting way in which we can think of um, reparation in relation to um, representations of sexual and gender-based violence in the public memory about Yaijame's rule um, in the Gambia. And so another part of the mandate is to promote non-recurrence and through the slogan and hashtag never again. So this is alongside hearings and um, it includes community outreach engagement activities, but also the works and in conversation also with, with Rwanda to, to talk about memorializations, you know, and what kind of memorial, what kind of memorial commemoration processes need to be um, considered. So in um, April of um, last year, there was a commemorative event um, about these um, incidents, the events that Seinabu Kamara talks about, the 2000 um, student massacre. And, uh, but still, the, the commemoration also is um, in tension with the promise or the, the mandates, um, interest and statement about reparations, since um, many um, victim family don't feel that there has been justice or there is even a transparent process to justice for their family members. Um, so a, a bit more about the um, TRC of what, what have happened um, so far. Um, so Baba, I had an interview with Baba Gali Jallo, who's the executive secretary of the uh, Gambian Truth, Reconciliation and Reparation Commissions in the summer of 2019. And so far as of, um, um, uh, I think, October 12, the themes that have been covered are the 22nd July um, 1994 coup, the November 11, um, 1994 incident, January arrest and incarceration of two members of, um, of the armed forces provisional rulings, the, um, the June murder of former finance minister Osman Korosise, and uh, um, here I'll skip and talk a little bit about also another important aspect in the investigations of human rights abuses during Yame's regime is Yame's alternative HIV AIDS and other disease alternative treatment program. And for now, for the remaining period of its mandate, the commission is scheduled to hold institutional hearings um, of the National Intelligence Agency and the judiciary among other public institutions. Um, and also extending to investigating and also having hearings about the 2005 murder of at least 
56 um, West African nationals, including 44 Ghanaians in forced disappearance and the April 2016 incident during which several people were arrested and tortured, resulting in at least one death. And so the commission also hopes to hear testimony from other um, junglers and Jame security forces and victims of sexual and gender-based violence. So there's been a stress and there have been even during the suspension of hearings due to COVID, there's been much outreach about um, sexual and gender-based violence. Um, and although initially the commission was planning to conclude its public hearings this uh, uh, past October, um, the suspensions due to COVID have made that um, impossible. And so um, just to, to think of um, this kind of model, uh, I think taking on and, and, and learning from South Africa is to think of an inclusive model of reconstruction. And there, um, the principle that is used is not Ubuntu specifically, but one can see traces of that principle in terms of thinking about what the new Gambia should be like. Um, so community renewal is um, a, a key aspect of it. And then I'll, I'll talk about what Kenya Lane women, what is Kenya Lane women's role in this process. Um, again, the creation of a women's affairs unit and with COVID, um, the story circle had to be, in, circles had to be interrupted. But at the time I visited and was conducting in field work, um, they were many story circles. And, this, and the reason for this is again, this attempt, I think what is, um, and what are layers of very complex ways in which people, um, and especially women, Gambian women, and also it's relevant for Senegalese women, I would Senegambian women avoid talking about um, sexual violence and, and gender-based violence due to the kind of um, consequences it have, the stigma, but also um, just the difficulties of narrating that kind of trauma in the public forum. So this women's circle I kind of embodied um, and, and reflected aspect of what peace builder, Liberian peace builder and Nobel Prize winner, Dima Gbo used to do in her peace building work, which is like the shedding, shedding of the weight, that's what she calls it. Um, and in those, um, what was interesting is that in some instances, facilitators were able to engage into um, discussing what constitutes actually political injury, whereas participants didn't really realize they, ex they had experienced any harm from um, the political leadership or from Yaya Jame's regime. And so this wasn't done through one sitting in a circle and saying, this happened to me, this happened to that, but really interesting through, there was a moment when there was a pause and, and in some way, I think just related to the difficulty of grappling with traumatic memory. And then uh, all of a sudden a woman got up and started tapping um, his foot, her foot on the ground. And that's how a song started. And the song then became a story about how she lost two sons in the crossing, what's commonly referred in the Gambia as the back way. So those are really aesthetic forms that I think that are not um, permissible or that haven't been um, given space in hearing, um, in hearings, in the official hearings at the Truth and Reconciliation Commission headquarters, but the alternative processes that go along with that you know, collection and making of collective memory and also that negotiating of space um, and voice in the making of public and historical memory too. Um, so this work and, and this paper is really um, about African women survivors of political violence. So a case in uh, point here is, is the Gambia and Gambian women but in a right, it attempts to think about African survivors of political violence who question uh, 
socio-political mechanism through which the trauma figure in the production of public memory. So um, I think of uh, my, my um, thinking and conceptualization of this project have been informed by the work of novelist and playwright Vera Vera Liking, who's Cameroonian, but also filmmaker Jean-Marie Tenot, political theorist Ashin Bembe, um, who've demonstrated an aesthetic, political, and ethical engagement with trauma as a process to engage with decoloniality. Their works have taken on the silencing machines of um, the colonial and post-colonial eras and torn through violent archives. They ground their aesthetics on the possibility for the current decolonizing wave to heed the tide of preceding current so as to restore the in reality and nothingness assigned to African histories by Western discourse and this is Mbembe. This intent is not to heal a violent past, but to show an entanglement of present, past, and futures that retain their death of other present, past, and futures, each age bearing, altering, and maintaining the previous ones, as Bimbe says. In addressing this um, entanglement, um, like King Teno and also the women I will talk about in Bimbe, implicitly address what is not remembered and challenges to reflect on the social, cultural, political, and intellectual processes through which forgetting and rewriting are accomplished in the decolonial archives. So in this process of, you know, a kind of tension between forgetting and rewriting, um, what is the work of Ubuntu? And how do we think of Ubuntu for it to be in line with, um, um, a decolonial praxis. And so what, has, what are the practices that mediate how African women's um, histories are remembered and reproduced, reproduced? What is the relationship between state-sanctioned memory production and forms of memory based in transgressive collective and individual experiences? Um, and here, I move to, again, I call on Lima Bowie, um, who was quoted by Kiwo um, Sowa on a forum that also thinks of Ubuntu. And then um, I quote here, and then the women came. They spoke to me and they held me. They comforted me and helped me put my life back together again. They helped me feel like a human being again. And so this is um, kind of a, 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 an image. I just wanted to um, use this story of, of Lima Bowie talking about how international reporters um, were talking to Congolese women and that the international reporters were really focused on the pain, the atrocities, the victimization, whereas um, here it is the agency on, on the passage that I just quoted and then the women came um, and they helped me put my life back together. How does that um, capture an ethics of care, but also the essence of Kanyeleng Kafo? Um, and uh, Kanyeleng here is Mandinka for a woman who cannot bear children, um, whom society considers infertile and whose children die at an early age. And um, for the associations which are referred to as Kanyeleng Kafo, their groups and, and really I think um, community organization through their power to organize, but also to create a collective. I wouldn't even call it a sisterhood um, due to, I think, um, thinking of uh, Ronke or uh, criticism of sisterhood in um, Western epistemologies, but and I want to think of like the kind of indigenous practices of that term here through care and, 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 and collectivity um, and also at the margins coming from a position of the margins. Um, so um, the, uh, uh, so when I ask my um, uh, interviewees about what Kanyeleng is, I didn't get like a, the answer of, of like the 
kind of a concept or the, the concept of group, but it was rather a personal story that went into the collective. And this is interestingly enough that my research assistant in the Gambia happened to be related to the man who introduced one of my um, interviewees on the picture on the left here, Banna Conte, and also uh, the leader of the Kanyalenka for the Western District um, to really talk about how my um, research assistant's relative, I think grandfather had helped her and introduced her to Kanyaleng because she was married, young at the time and married for 12 years and didn't have children and experienced the stigma of childlessness and um, was very isolated. And um, so what happened is that my um, research assistant relative gave Banna Conte a pet, a dog, um, to pet and then introduce her to the Kanyaleng group in the community. And then um, she became part of this community that is considered a marginal one, but yet that has a voice because of um, its importance and stance in, um, in Gambia, in Mandinka birth ritual and processes. And also what is interesting about Kanyaleng Kafo groups is that all rituals, any member who seeks to adhere has to go, um, has to undergo a ritual and the rituals are not that just a really sync, I think as a way of being with nature. Um, and very simple in terms of just uh, singing, dancing, but also cooking and communing together and just caring for the person and believing that um, there is a real beyond the present, the now, that each person in, in, in relation with the other can um, move to that realm, to the spiritual and face any challenges in, in terms of spirit who might prevent women um, to bear children who might prevent women to raise their children um, in adulthood. So any member who joins one, they are able to conceive and have a healthy child. They have to kind of offer a covenant in some ways. And so in some cases, some women shave their head and some they are in various ways. But also one can be um, kanyeling um, by this affiliation and on notions of care. For example, um, um, one of my participants, husband was the one who was part of Kenya Lang because she was, he was an orphan and the Kenya Lang Women's Association in, him, in his neighborhood took him in as a child and really raised him. So when um, he became married, um, his wife became Kanyaling and also his wife happens to be an activist in China, a feminist activist in the Gambia. And so here, um, through this um, principles of, of generosity and also through um, this notion of Ubuntu that Archbishop Desmond Tutu defined in, and I quote says, um, hey, so and so has Ubuntu. What does that mean? It means then you are generous, I quote, you are hospitable, you are friendly and caring and passionate. Tutu's explanation here emphasizes a key characteristic of Ubuntu, the quality of community care and solidarity from the margins. And um, in thinking of um, uh, you know, feminist, uh, but also, ways of thinking about Ubuntu in post-traumatic uh, societies, but also in healing trauma. I um, call on and also refer a lot to the work of Pumlago Boto Malikizela, who has underscored the importance of embodied empathy, which is a feature of Ubuntu ethics of care, at least the way I read it in the Kanyalenka Falls in Gambia. She has also pointed out the need to reconsider the maternal bodies as a site of ethical engagement with traumatic history. And scholastic Mukasonga, um, who writes about the Rwandan genocide, echoes this when she writes about her mother's inzu, the heart, as the symbol of 
a lost sight that she longs for, but also a symbol of memory and self-recreation. So stop. Um, move to this. So what are the questions that I'm thinking of just in thinking about um, this kind of embodied care and the relationality and interwoven aspects of um, Kanyaling um, women's associations and the, the, the kind of synchrony with nature and, and its implication to for climate activism, though this is not what I'm trying to chew on now. But really to think if Kanyaling um, Women's Association exists in the Gambia, why aren't they um, kind of, why aren't their voices amplified in the transitional justice processes and mechanisms? Like why is the institution of the PRRC not um, highlighting this kind of um, indigenous um, epistemological forms of dealing with marginality? Um, and also violence and namely gender-based violence. So I, I am just wondering, um, here are some questions that I'm thinking about um, in, in, in going back to Saini Kamara's uh, story that she doesn't want to use the word rape or any a kind of sexual violence, yet it is strongly, it strongly resonates in her testimony that her injury were um, kind of um, in, uh, kind of sexual injuries and that was almost erased from the archive as she was marked and brought to the morgue as corpse number three and spent three months in the hospital without adequate medical treatment. So how does that testimony then, which is part of now the archive of Jamie's regime, how does it um, allow us to think about um, the place of, of gender-based violence. And I'm, I'm most interested in what is not talked about, the kind of silence truth that she, she chose, what she chose not to tell. And, and, and thinking of that, and also in relation to, um, to um, another part of the testimony that I didn't talk about later, Commissioner asked, Commissioner Sosti asked if she was, she, uh, if the twins survived, they didn't survive, but did she have any other children? And she said, yes. And did she go any treatment um, outside of the hospital? And she said, yes. But I wonder what kind of treatment? So um, she said, yes, but they were limited because her family was um, kind of financially challenged to have her with her treatment. So in this way, I'm thinking, um, how might um, women's ritual performances around childbirth, child reading contribute to opening up a dialogic space on the taboo issue of sexual violence. If we had a performance, for example, if Saini Kamara was in some way um, involved in a Kanye language performance where the discussion is about um, any form of traumatic experience that is related to sexual and gender-based violence, um, what would would well, like the kind of missing letter, not to be Lacanian here, but what the information that is missing, but we know is there, um, that, but it is without. Um, how would that space be different, and how would that testimony would, how would that testimony be different? How can ritual convey the reality of trauma, sexual um, specific to sexual violence, but also. Um, how does the acknowledgement of such trauma lead to innovative um, initiative to um, ensure equal access to justice? And here, um, finally, I, uh, how am I doing on time? Minus 10 minutes. <laughs> oh, okay. <laughs> we can quickly wrap up and then we can go to a conversation with everyone. Okay, yes, I'll quickly wrap up. Um, I'll just stop sharing here. But I, I wanted to um, just come back to this idea of Ubuntu as an ethics of care, but also um, as practiced by Kanyaling Women's Association. Um, and the, 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 the 
kind of most prevalent ways in which the ethics of care is practiced and lived is also to what um, Ifua mentioned in her presentation in terms of um, child care and shared motherhood. So um, a child born to the world um, uh, brought by Kenya language is the child of the community and it is the community's responsibility. And by community, I mean the Kenya language association to be the child to adulthood. Um, and even the name is not the sole kind of uh, piety or decision of the parents. So the group has to decide on what to name the child. And that has to do whether the mother had had previous um, pregnancies or had had um, um, uh, babies who died at birth or at a very young age. Um, so with that, um, you know, care is communal, but it's also personal. And then the question of memory is very important, I think. And I think it is also a question that is uh, center in, in, deep, in debates about um, um, subjectivities, whether it is post-colonial subjectivities, and now also in the decolonial turn, I think memory is important in um, and, and must be considered in addressing the challenges of democratization for post -author authoritarian um, states and here um, the, in the case of the Gambia. Um, and so of course mem memory is very entangled and, and, and issues of guilt and complicity make it also um, very challenging to kind of pass out and what, consider what is considered um, official memory, and that is part of the archive that any institution like the Truth, Reconciliation and Reparation Commission will put forth. But I, I want to hear combined and, and have an approach of parallel reading of the kind of institutional epistemology and practice of the TRRC but in parallel contrast with what is happening in the everyday lives of the Gambian, but also before the TRRC, how the existence of such um, a strong community organization as Kanyaleng Kafo can inform, but also expand issues of inclusivity that we've found with um, transitional justice processes on the continent, but also elsewhere. So, um, I will stop by saying that here in terms of memory and care, it shows that it is not just static and it's like, it just like a wheel, a circle that turns around and that is worked on as just taking care and caring for someone and something productive and capable of affecting lasting ontological change. So how do we embrace um, Ubuntu as care and also Ubuntu as memory both um, collective and individual, but fully um, embracing the tension between the collective and, and individual um, and, and, and the place of narrative, narrative um, through songs, Kanye uh, Lang Women's Song, but also a performance and performativity. Thank you. Thank you so much, Emily, for that very, very rich paper. Uh, and just a lot of the invitations, I think you were throwing at us. I'm hoping that people will engage uh, uh, the questions you posed, but also the invitations you threw at us. I thought it was such a powerful story, this one of a woman who gets up and just starts tapping and then a song emerges, but also pow so powerful, but also so common. I mean, I, I think of some of the stories my grandmother tells me and it resonates and really, really powerful. Uh, very interesting connections between the papers that have been presented by Emily and Efua. Connections around one talking about Ubuntu as care, Ubuntu as development from Efua's, but this notion of motherhood coming up, childlessness in the one side, but on another side, this notion of motherhood is something that's shared and so forth. I thought that was very interesting. And as I was listening to your paper, Emily, I mean, in South Africa, when you think about 1994, uh, it's this, you know, it's mm -hmm. the country it talks about 1994. Well, maybe not so much anymore because we're starting to see how the rainbow nation is, so-called rainbow nation is falling apart. But when you think about 1994 in the South African case, 
it's this moment when things are starting to come together, uh, democracy and so forth, post-apartheid moment. But when you go to the rest of the continent, Rwanda, and now you are sharing with us an example from the Gambia, that actually in other parts of the continent, it means something totally different. I think that really always strikes me when I hear about these kind of uh, 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 that what you were sharing, this, uh, this, uh, these histories of our continent. Um, when you were talking again, I was reminded of Ntabiseng Motsime's work, who talks about silences also, but also how the mute always speak. Uh, and I think that's what you were kind of inviting us to think about how there's different ways in which people engage with their histories, with memory and so forth, but how the mute essentially always speak. In South Africa, I'm not sure how familiar you are with uh, the, con the kind of conversations that we've been having since, 19 since 2015, actually, around the TRC, where people are starting to seriously criticize what the TRC was able to, the kind of conversations that it muted, uh, even mm -hmm. though it was meant to open up space. So to hear you saying that there's a lot of drawing from the South African case, I'm interested in, in just hearing a little bit more about uh, these kind of conversations we're having in the country now, about how actually the TRC is not or was not in the case of South Africa, a space, but rather it foreclosed spaces. Lots of interesting, uh, I think, similarities or parallels between the two papers. But what also struck me is that Emily's paper, you seem to, you are wanting us to historicize these ideas of, uh, or practices of care. And I, I'm not gonna say sisterhood, but uh, this, this idea of these women coming together and doing all of this. And F.O.'s paper seems to be doing something slightly different, unless I'm, I'm mishearing. F.O.'s is, is talking about really the contemporary. Uh, mm -hmm. I know F. Well, that you talk a little bit, a little bit about the displacement, but I didn't get a sense of how that displacement has an impact in these practices of mothering or motherhood. Whereas I think for Emily, she was really locating it within the historical uh, or the history of the women in the Gambia and so forth. So I'd be interested to hear from both of you or rather from FWA what you think about this historicization because I think there's something powerful about it when you're thinking about these kinds of uh, uh, everyday forms or what you are calling freedoms between these two mothers FWA. It's unfortunate that you, you're not in video but when we're talking about these freedoms and these these kind of interactions between these two mothers, locating it within the contemporary moment and, and what you think about historicizing it. Because I think in the African context or in the African continent, and I may be essentializing certain things here, but there's certainly a kind of, it seems to me, at least my reading of literature, that there's a, a longer history of these kind of connections, not necessarily within families. So what you were saying, biological or family relations, that there's a longer history of people sharing or people mothering together in a community where there are no biological bonds whatsoever. So I thought I was, I'd be interested then if what you hear your thoughts around, around this historicizing and, um, and also what I thought was happening on one side was to draw in the community, right? And, and the focus on the two mothers. And I'm thinking if how these two women, how what they are doing speaks to broader things in the community or broader practices of motherhood in or mothering in the community beyond just the two of them. As you can see, the sun is starting to come up. Um, apologies about that if it's messing up with your video. But I mean, there's so many interesting things here uh, that I think were raised. Uh, and I, I'm going to, I, I don't know if FOI you wanna respond to some of the provocations as a result of Emily's paper. And then I will go to the Q&A sessions, but very, very interesting papers, both of you. And I'm, I'm looking forward to the conversation. FY, you muted. <laughs> I can see you're busy with the baby. Sorry about that. Um, thank, I was saying thank you for, um, for pulling our papers together so nicely. Um, yeah, I also... Um, so in terms of the historicization, um, what I talk about when I, I, I mention displacement, um, it comes from earlier work that I was doing where I was looking at um, the experiences of, of children living in um, temporary location areas. So 
what's currently happening in South Africa is that we continue to have forced removals um, that occur, um, which are of course uh, state-led. Um, and that's the history and that initial trauma of displacement is, is what I was referring to. Um, and perhaps maybe there can be a similarity that could be drawn um, because that initial trauma of displacement continues to be um, replicated and it somehow etched itself in the subconscious of, of families and generations. So, so for the young people who I'm working with now, they're living a life of precarity where they're constantly moving from pillar to post, from house to house, dwelling to dwelling, unsure, um, insecure. Um, and um, and that's, that's part of the, the, the overarching social determinants that, uh, that I speak of that don't allow for freedoms. And also that Amartya Sen um, explores in his work is that because of your economic circumstances and your social circumstances, you are unable to pursue the kinds of freedoms that are supposedly um, heralded, her heralded as the hallmarks of a democratic uh, state, which is South Africa purports itself to be a democratic state, but yet there are so many people who are not living in these freedoms that democracy allows and these freedoms that development allows. Um, and then there was a similarity uh, also with what, what struck me in, in Emily's um, presentation was with these silences. And yes, um, Debbie saying what the prof, what the, as, um, uh, the mute always speaks is a, is a, is a very powerful paper, a very powerful idea, a very powerful provocation. Um, and at the same time, um, when when Emily was talking about the silences, what was interesting for the young women um, is that is that they're very unsilent, uh, they're very unmuted, and it's just this idea of mute, muting voices. It's not necessarily that voices are muted in, in my particular study. Um, it's more that there's no one interested in. It's about power, really, because they're speaking very loudly, speaking very clearly, mm -hmm. um, demanding very clear. Um, the sets of issues and it's just that the platform that's afforded is not really it's not really adequate enough to actually hold all of those voices um so there's a failure there's a failure in that and that is actually essentially also the failure of the the trc and yes these during the mass war movements these kinds of in 2015 these kinds of failures were really came <laughs> came to the surface but Certainly, there's been a lot of people writing about and criticizing actually the TRC, the proceedings of the TRC, that it somehow managed to try and um, almost in a positivist framework, tries to conclude this long history of, of trauma into a series of, of um, uh, truth tellings. Um, and, you know, it was forcing people to recreate themselves as victims. Um, so a lot of the critique actually is that is that the TRC was a massive failure in South Africa. Um, since 19, the work of Pam, Pamela Reynolds, also Fiona Ross writes about it. Um, and, um, oh goodness, I forget. Uh, Elaine Salo also writes about it. Um, so there's a number of, there's a number of, 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 of um, ways in which I think that our paper, Emily, uh, our papers speak to each other, but in terms of the shared motherhood, it's more um, that they are very vocal. There are no silences there. She speaks in the documentary, and I think I'll, I somehow I'll figure out a way to post the, the link to the documentary there because she speaks very eloquently and she speaks very powerfully about her journey uh, and very openly about her, her journey into motherhood and that shared experience. So I'll just finish there. <laughs> Thanks. Uh, Emily, I'm not sure if you want to respond and then I'll go to a QA. and a um. um, I, I, I guess if you want to kind of um, also point to something that Fawa mentioned about um, this kind of, uh, the, the kind of silence I'm reading into it, but yet um, a, there is in, in, work and the the mothers that she's working with that there is like 
because it's very, they're not muted, they are very vocal, they take a space and voice, but yet the kind of institutional frameworks or platform are not um, kind of <laughs> amplifying those voices. So I'm thinking also in, in, in terms of this kind of long history of Kagenlen Women's Association and their existence in the Gambia, and just how um, puzzling it is to me that the, the kind of when the mandate for the TRRC was passed that there was not, and the human, Women's Affairs Unit was set and all this consideration, which is also learned from what are considered failures from the South African TRC process, which is this kind of um, choking a certain narrative of, of national unity and reconciliation and, and excluding some voices or muting some voices or just avoiding any, um, what Kali could see or cause any accented conversations in, in terms of tensions. But um, yes, learn, wanting to learn from that, but yet um, the kind of sensibilities, the kind of local sensibilities and tools that are in place through um, the existence of these associations are in, in some way um, uh, not considered. I, I'm just puzzled at how, for me, I think they are, uh, must have been more substantial engagement of these associations in the process, whether it is through the outreach activities or through the kind of um, kind of centered institutional space of the headquarters and all the all that is happening there through hearings and so on. Uh, thank you so much to both of you. A couple of questions. Uh... Oh, one announcement from Upenu that we are looking to upload the recording for today's webinar and the two previous webinars within a week. And then there are a couple of questions. I'll start with Philip's question for you, Emily. Emily, thank you for presenting on a topic that I'm passionate about. I don't think the subject of gender-based violence and trauma is receiving the attention it deserves in many African countries. My question is, do you think you're getting substantive inputs from men on this issue or does it not matter? And the second question, I'm not sure if you're noting them, Emily. The second question uh, is for both of you. Okay, the second question is actually for Efua. Efua, I'm not sure if you're still there. Uh, thank you to both of you for informative and creative presentation. My questions to you, Efua, this is from Anne. How do you, how do you, how do the Ubuntu practices of childcare and mothering as enacted by these two women, borrow from their mothers and grandmothers and communities. Are these two women involved in sharing their practices with other young women in the community? That's the second, that's the first question for you, Efua. And then there was another one uh, in the chat room. I'm just not able to, okay. Emily, it's very interesting. Thanks a lot uh, for the talk around unity and reconciliation of our humanity always sets South Africa as an example of how to begin going through that journey. What is it that stands out to the world about South Africa reconciling? Is it because the blacks did not violently fight back against apartheid? It would be nice to understand this from a perspective of someone who is not from South Africa. That's a question from Zama. So one question for you, Efua, and uh, two questions for you, Emily. Do you want to go first for this round, Emily, and then Efua after you? Um, sure, I'll go briefly, and I'll start with uh, Zama's question. Thank you. That's a great question. I think, you know, the, what is fascinating, I guess, and, and also um, um, about um, South Africa, I think it is really in as as you mentioned earlier, Sandra, like what if we think of 1994 on the continent, right? So we can think of you know that is the the maybe ending the work of decolonization or or the just like the kind of um, getting to independence at the very kind of constitutional level. But it it is it is for me I read it also as a beginning of decoloniality as we move from the process of you know, national sovereignty to kind of um, liberation, 
really liberation and, and freedom and liberation from what? Um, not in, in the case, and I'm thinking of Rwanda, I'm thinking of, um, of uh, um, the Gambia with Germany's coup, but also even before 1994 in West Africa, we had Sierra Leone um, in Liberia, which kept on going. And so what it's kind of that decoloniality in a way of thinking about what, what does it mean, you know, to be an African nation state, but also how, what does the concept of freedom and how do we liberate ourselves from ourselves in, in some ways? Um, so I, I think South Africa is interesting for that. But also another thing I was going to say is that uh, it's, it was an experiment, really, a, a, a very, um, an, an experiment that attempted um, inclusivity and, and tried a holistic way and also founded, yes, on um, Christian principles, which also I think informed um, Tutu's conception and vision of Ubuntu. Um, and, and also another and one of the most important aspects and in relation to South Africa marking the entrance into decoloniality is that it's, it's not an end. <laughs> There's, it's not a process with an end date. It's still ongoing. And I think in 2000, you know, 2015, we saw a new wave and that wave, which is kind of spreading around the world in, in Senegal in the summer, if we had talks about, you know, uh, you know, opposing the government, trying to rename Gore Island some other after some other you know colonial very colonized name and and all the protests even in the diaspora about police brutality but also on the continent I think it it shows that the work of decolonizing is is it's ongoing and and I think that is why South Africa is fascinating in this way the other question am I engaging men um for the first sec part of collecting this data um, I was more interested in like just the women's association, but in also talking because I was doing um, interviews with the women's association, but also with members and staff members of the TRRC, really interested in um, the kind of, of course, we are dealing with a very um, political patriarchal system and how do they think about um, kind of this idea of a new Gambia that, that is kind of open and free for all and, and democratic for all and thinking of all the complex gender, um, gendering processes and issues that are also related to gender, namely um, female genital cutting. So I'll stop there and, and turn it to the floor. Um, uh, thanks, Anne, for your question. Um, so I'm just going to repeat the question. How do the Ubuntu practices of childcare and mothering as enacted by these two and borrow from their mothers, grandmothers and communities? Um, thanks actually for, for posing that question. Um, also what's evident in the documentary is that the, so there's, there's two young mothers. One of the mothers um, has had multiple pregnancies and births that um, have not been in medical terms, what they term have not been viable. Um, and the other young woman um, has birthed, um, and so the two of them are mothers to that little one. Um, and the mother, the grandmother there, um, is is very encouraging of mothering for her. Um, for her, that's the greatest honor in life in in one's life is to be a mother. So indeed, I think that their framing of of motherhood is 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 entirely borrowed from from her, from the grandmother, which is why I said that I'm, I'm less interested in making um, a general, a general, um, a generalization about a particular phenomena um, and say like, you know, this motherhood is shared in low socioeconomic areas, blah, blah, blah. So that's, I'm not, I, I don't want to make any sweeping statements like that. Um, and so I'm just very interested in the, in, 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 in particular instances where Ubuntu is forged or uh, so where Ubuntu can be tied um, to motherhood um, and that their recognition of who they are in community and who they are as persons is contingent upon this shared motherhood. Um, 
and then the other question was, are these two women involved in sharing their practices with other young mothers in the community? So I hope that sort of covers um, the question. No, it's just very particular to these two families that work well. And even, and even um, the, the, the brother, the brother of the young woman who, um, who has a, a child, um, a living child that is, um, she, he's very, very protective. And he describes his relationship with his nephew, sorry, his niece, that there's no, there's no such thing as niece, that's his child. He frames it as that, that's my baby. Um, so everybody, you know, in that particular family, they, they seem to have really gotten down to the, um, what I understand as the, the um, it's almost like the, the, the timbers, the, the essence of Ubuntu is that, you know, you really, you you become you you are you are you in in fullness and in full personhood only in interaction with somebody else who's able to mirror that um, that essence also. Um, so it's not it's not in that loose form of like okay I need to go to work so I need to leave my my child with the neighbor. It goes beyond that. It goes it's it's it's. It's, it's beyond those framings of like leave your child with your neighbor and and that means that we are our kin or or I can feed or even sh shared breastfeeding um, uh, it's 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 that kind of a thing that I'm trying to drive at is there's something more than the affinal and consagonal relationships that have been described in anthropological literature um, and I want to suggest that it is this practice on, on, a, on a micro scale of Ubuntu. And I'm very cautious not to make generalizations about um, families, uh, families across, across South Africa. Thank you. Uh, thank you, Efwa and uh, Emily for those responses. Um, there is another question from Tando. Uh, the question, the question, well, Tanda says that thank you for very much, Emily and Efwa, for wonderful presentations and these fascinating dialogues. Looking at the culture of violence in general and violence towards women in particular and children in African countries and particular in countries like South Africa, would you say that Ubuntu is still very, is still much alive or are we just remaining with the idea of Ubuntu than practicing it on the daily basis, the way our forebearers used to do it. I think that is for you, F4, or maybe for both of you. Uh, I'll just tag on another, oh, I think there's one, okay. Uh, another question, I, I suppose, I mean, one of the things you were talking about, um, Emily, and maybe you can elaborate on this, you touched very briefly on this spirituality and connections with nature when you were talking about notions of Ubuntu within this group. I was wondering if you can say a little bit more because whenever we talk about Ubuntu, the emphasis is on the humans uh, and not so much the nature. So I'm interested in hearing what you meant by that. And then another one is around um, what struck me and I think you, you raised this in some of your questions is just these masculine conceptions of uh, reconciliation, of violence, and what those conceptions that are very much driven by masculine notions, what they, they do to how we think about justice and uh, limit rather also how we think about reconciliation. So I'd be interested in hearing a little bit more about that. And for you, Efwa, I mean, when I was reading your abstract, I was struck by this idea of freedom but what kept coming to mind as I was reading uh, the paper you sent was the idea of like a resistance of sorts uh, in support structures. And I was, I was wondering why freedom, you know? Um, because it seemed to me, and I'm not saying this is the case, but it was what, I, what kept coming to my mind as I was reading uh, the abstract you sent it, it's this idea of everyday forms of resistance or everyday forms of coping with, as you were saying, a structural constraints. And I'm wondering when does like a, a form of resistance or uh, not maybe not resistance, but coping strategies that people come up with in a community, but somewhat borrowing from their history. When does that become 
freedom or what makes it freedom? Uh, in what ways does that relate to the notion of freedom as you were talking about in your paper? Because what kept coming to mind for me really, it was, this seems like support structures between the women and actually it resonates a lot with how a lot of, so not thinking about family in terms of um, nuclear family, but really thinking about family in, in much more expansive way, where it's me and it's my neighbors, we all belong to one family my father is my neighbor's father and is everybody else's father and not just mine. So I was thinking about these being supportive structures between women and drawing from the past and to what extent then these supportive structures, what makes them freedom? Uh, I'm not sure if that, that, that capture you and you get what I'm trying to get at here, but that's what I wanted to pose in addition to the question that's been posed by Nomdo Yi Yanatango. Do you know um, if you want to start with what, and then uh, Emily? Sure. Um, I'll start with just answering your framing up on this on this uh, concept of freedom. Um, so um, I brought in the concept of freedom because I wanted to try and um, I wanted to try and get as close as possible to 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 what it, what it was about this relationship between the two young women um, that was more than just, af more than just a, an affinal relationship and more than just a blood relationship. Um, and I, I think I was, I was trying to, which is why I'm, I, I'm, I, was, I, I, I sort of tried to piggyback on um, Amatya Sen's work where he's describing, um, where he's describing um, freedom as uh, sort of, sorry, like the exercise of freedom is, is mediated by values, um, and that those values uh, those values are in turn um, influenced by social interactions. So that's that part that that part where the freedom it's the freedom to to move the free sorry so so the the part that it becomes a freedom is the, the freedom to reinvent how people understand who a mother is. So in, in the medical sciences, um, of course, it's a very positive framing of what a mother is. And a mother is the person who's the primary caregiver, um, who is responsible for um, the, the rearing and for the nurturing of the child. Um, but yet between these two young mothers, um, I mean, of course, one is the, the 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 primary caregiver, but yet those lines become a lot more porous. Um, and it's not just I feel like it's the relationship. Perhaps it's because I've known them since they were ten years old, and they are now uh, in their early twenties. Um, so perhaps I, I see maybe I'm reading a little bit too much into how they are renegotiating who a mother is. And that's what I'm. That's that's the aspect of freedom is that there's a freedom to 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 re reimagine who a mother is. That's the aspect of freedom. It's not necessarily that I'm 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 wanting to reinvent the wheel or redescribe what freedom is. It's just they're moving so far beyond um, what anthropology has described as affinal and consanguinal relationships. They are they are really living in that sense, that essence of Ubuntu. And I, I suppose my difficulty is trying to, and this is, this is what, I, what I earlier, um, I used to uh, do some work some time ago for the Centro Studio Association. I was asked to write a paper on Ubuntu. And uh, I mean, the challenge I had then was to try and put into words the essence of Ubuntu. Um, and in, in some ways it's very difficult, it's a very difficult practice to take this, this, this being quality, which is why I wanted to bring in um, Heidegger's work on the essence of being. It's a, it's a performance. It's not something that you can sort of pin down on, um, in script and say, this is, you know, Ubuntu is, is, is alive. It's, a, it's, it's so dynamic and it constantly moves. And I think that's why I call it a freedom because you can't capture it. You can't capture it on a, on a piece of paper. I, I, at least I'm struggling to capture it on a piece of paper. And if that's, it's that kind of um, the freedom that I'm alluding to. And then the other question, sorry, I'm trying to find it. 
How do I find it again? Um, oh, there it is. I the other question it, is uh, looking at is culture it still, still alive. Is it still alive or are we just remaining with the idea yeah. of Ubuntu rather than practicing it? Well, this is precisely what I'm trying to suggest is that, um, you know, it seems like as if it is like, you know, a practice of old. Um, but I think, I think it, it, it isn't. It's, it's clearly evident um, in Delft. These young women, they recognize each other. They, they're fostering a sense of belonging, a sense of personhood, a sense of, 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 of me being whole in connection to the other person. And it doesn't need to be this massive meta-narrative of reconciliation, which I think was co-opted. I think the, the TRC co-opted this idea of Ubuntu um, when actually it is something that we, we, do, we do very easily in everyday practices. Um, um, and, and, and that's essentially what I, wanted to, I want to name is that actually in the everyday, um, we have this, this freedom to reinvent all of these positivist ideas or these Western notions of what a mother is or, or how, it is, how we're supposed to be good neighbors. We don't need texts to, to, to get at that essence of being. So I don't actually think that, um, I think we, some people practice, not everyone, of course, but some people on those micro levels um, in the everyday practice of Ubuntu. The difficulty with Ubuntu, I think, becomes when you try and extract it out from these, these daily interactions from like one person to the other and try and make it into this huge meta structure and say that our whole country is practicing Ubuntu. You sometimes, I feel like the, 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 the sort of like the placing of this kind of a grand narrative on a philosophy that is based on a on a on a on a beingness quality uh, somehow makes makes it very difficult to to, um, to trust. I don't trust that you can say at a societal level from one community to the next this community is acting in Ubuntu. I think Ubuntu has that everyday um, personable private experience. Thank you. I'm just uh, going to jump in and where um, before uh, answer ended, which is really to think about Ubuntu, is it, is it still alive? So I would rather kind of reconsider the question and frame it as, and, and also this is me as a literary scholar and, and say as, how do we read and articulate Ubuntu, you know, across um, the quotidian, but also the larger um, institutional framework? So how do we even bring Ubuntu in those institutional frameworks? What kind of um, leadership models or models of um, resistance and mobilization and political culture um, do we want in place? And how do we use the vision of Ubuntu. And, and, and I am saying vision here uh, in referring to the kind of meta narrative of reconciliation in the South Africa TRC. I think Ubuntu there was a vision that really wanted to kind of a, uh, to emphasize um, the, the need for a kind of peaceful transition. And I think that's those are like huge questions that any possible uh, kind of apartheid, but also any place in authoritarian rule, any country grapples with. Um, so for example, with recent um, events in, uh, in Nigeria, we can think of how, how do we articulate a vision of, of um, citizenship or, or national, even leadership that um, puts Ubuntu at play or that favors Ubuntu. We're also in uh, thinking about gender-based violence. How do we think of Ubuntu as a framework? So um, it could be vision, but also paradigm as a paradigm that we deploy. And I mean, we as scholars, how do we deploy it and re-articulate it in, of course, the context from which it is emerging, um, not that there is a fits, one size fits all um, formula. And, but I think it is in, 
and really being able to read between the lines, but also to, I like to focus on agency really. Um, and uh, to, to think of always the, 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 the other part, <laughs> which is the daily acts of resistance um, that, uh, exist, that exist alongside um, so much pain, trauma and violence. And to see how those are in some way informed by Ubuntu or not, but also how can they help us articulate a vision of Ubuntu that is um, uh, adapt for our circumstances in the 21st century during COVID, post COVID or whatever, yeah, on the continent, but also you can say um, for a Senegal, but it can be as microcosmic as, you know, just in my own locality here in Chies. Um, the other question uh, that you asked Asanda is about the kind of approaches to post-conflict reconstruction or transitional justice mechanisms that are rooted in, in some kind of um, uh, patriarchal use the word masculine. I'm not sure if you wanted to just refer to masculinities and their influences on um, the implementation of transitional justice processes. But yeah, I mean, if we think of I think it's actually adapt to think about what is the impact of, um, of uh, you know, masculinities, but also the systems that generate different kinds of masculinities in 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 uh, in, in thinking about frameworks for reconstruction, um, whether it is in post-conflict zone or in any society um, trying to. Um, uh, transition from authoritarian rule. Um, uh, how do we, how do we think of the very? I, I guess here the question also uh, you you kind of suggested to me is to think of um, not just um, masculinities or patriarchal systems, but how do we think of intersections and, and the various processes in which gender inform these mechanisms or not. Um, and how to think of, you know, what kind of provisions and what kind of thinking and theorizing need to take place in order to get to the holistic frameworks and inclusive frameworks that have been imagined and envisioned for South Africa that the Gambia had imagined and is trying to work towards, um, and also many other places. Um, I think there was a third question. Was there a third question? Uh, I think it was about nature, spirituality, what you had suggested. But maybe you can reflect on that in your closing remarks because I'm looking at time. We have about six minutes. So I'm going to just read one last question from Zama and you can hold on to that one. And then, uh, okay, Zama says, at Efua, in most African cultures, if the man of the family cannot impregnate his wife, the elders would suggest that the man of the family must impregnate the woman. And this will usually be hidden from the husband. Do you think, this is one of the ideas that compel people to care for kids that are not of their own, embracing Ubuntu, that's the question. Uh, and in responding to that question, F1, maybe you can just also share your last words with us and then we will close and hand over to Upenu. Um, thank you, Zama, for the question. Um, oh, I think there's, <laughs> I had to end off with that, to try and address that question in about one minute. Well, um, there's many things that are going on in, in, in your question there. Um, and I would try possibly to do a careful unpicking um, of, of very uh, worrisome sort of gender-based violent practices um, from, from an idea of Ubuntu. So not to collapse this idea of Ubuntu with, with uh, moral and possibly um, uh, questionable practices that that are not tied in in this idea of a of, of a shared humanity. However, I'm trying to I'm trying to understand your question as um, 
I mean, why I would I would pose another question is that why would it be hidden um, from the husband? And you know, consent is a very important thing. Many things going on with that question. Um, Maybe and you can so, get into the closing remarks. F1, I'm looking at time and um, yeah, just... yeah. Um, okay, so in um, my closing remarks, I'll try and also um, address uh, Zama's question. But basically, what I presented today um, is just a provocation. It's very much in its early uh, its research that is in its, it, that is in its infancy and it's in its early formulation. Um, so. You know, I, I appreciate the questions, of, uh, particularly around how are you thinking through freedom, and also uh, appreciating the questions around um, how are you, uh, you know you need to make that in, that suggests that I need to make a more of a careful distinction between things that are inherited from our parents, like just the usual everyday practice of sharing amongst aunties, uncles, um, grandfathers, grandmothers, um, and what is so particular about what's going on in Delft in this family. Um, and then just finally to say that I definitely don't want to make a commentary on society as a whole. And I think that is where the danger lies, is when we try and create Ubuntu as a blanket statement that we apply to um, some sort of moral and ethical practice. I think Ubuntu um, is an ontological, has an ontological framework, um, but it is more a philosophy that is lived out in daily in practice. It's more a philosophy that is performative than it is some sort of, you know, a meditation. Um, so, yeah, thank you so much for, for your ears um, and uh, for your time. Um, so, thanks very much. I'm not going anywhere. I'm just, uh, I'm just saying thank you. <laughs> thanks, Efwa. Uh, Emily, do you want to just quickly wrap yeah, up? quickly. Um, yeah, yeah, thank you. Thank you for these questions and for really um, also pro provoking some kind of post <laughs> presentation as it was really the intention for, for this um, paper to um, just uh, share and meditate some uh, and ruminate on some, some initial ideas. So thank you. So the, the, I, I just want to end up with the kind of spiritual aspect, which is really a key thing here for Kenya Lang Women's Association that kind of the realm of the human is also connected to another realm of the, the spiritual. And that is tied also with uh, being in synchrony with nature. And so hence the importance of water in performance and also any grown crops. And so in that, I am really appreciative of the fact that you mentioned that here, you know, Ubuntu is like the kind of human to human interconnectedness, but you're not necessarily thinking of the human in, um, in uh, their locality and also space and time. So um, that is something that I will really consider in rethinking this ethics of care for, for Ubuntu. And thank you to everyone who has been listening and for posing questions. So finish there. Thank you so much, Emily, for that and uh, Efwa. And to everyone who has posed questions, engaged our speakers, and also those who've just come in and listened. I'm going to hand over to Upenyu and he will tell us a little bit about plans that uh, they have for 2021. Thank you, everyone, and have a great evening if you're in South Africa, day if you're in the US. Over to you, Upenyu. Thank you. Thank you so much, Dr. Benya, for chairing the session. Thank you, Efua and uh, Emily, for your presentations. And for everyone who made time to attend this webinar, we really appreciate your joining us for the session.